We're now joined by Rush author Martin Popoff. Thank you so much for joining us, Martin. Yes, well, thanks for having me, Jay. This is very cool. Yes, Anthem is the book. Uh, very, very exciting. Nice cover, beautiful blue uh, foil on there. Rush in the 70s. You know, a lot of people consider the 70s the greatest era ever for music, you know, really laid the blueprint for the 80s, 90s, and what's come before, and we are celebrating the greatest Canadian band ever. I mean, out of the thousands of artists and pop stars and songwriters, I mean, Rush is on the top of that list. Um, but of course, they came from humble beginnings. Let's talk a little bit about you know, Rush in the beginning. Obviously, John Retzi was the was the drummer, and Geddy Lee and Alex Lifeson had known each other, I guess, from you know an earlier age. Uh, did they go to school together? Yeah, they they were in high school together, and basically, you know, I, I guess you could say that Rush paid their dues in a couple of ways, and one way is that early pre-LP time. I mean, they were essentially a band starting in around 1969, so they didn't really have their first album up for five years. The first album is 1974, and then, you know, they were basically... Uh, you know, at that point, they, I mean, they quickly got, uh, got a, got an American record deal with Mercury, um, and they were essentially your working band, um, doing all the things bands do, but of course doing it all on a shoestring. So they went probably, you know, the whole rest of the decade before they even really started making any money, but, um, you know, they, they were, they were essentially, um, you know, paying their dues, I guess, in the late seventies, in in a in a way as well. But uh, but certainly four years before they even put an album out. So obviously, coming up in the ranks, playing the the proms in the schools and the you know uh, the the little clubs, were they pretty much a cover band and slowly worked originals into their sets? Yeah, they did, they definitely did do a lot of that. Um, but yeah, they were they were doing their originals pretty early on. But their originals, they had some songs that weren't even on the first album, and they were a little more of that, uh, you know, meat and potatoes, Led Zeppelin, Bad Company style um, before Neil joined the band. Um, and yeah, you're right about where they played as well. I mean, they they basically didn't get too far afield. They were essentially a, a Toronto area, you know, Ontario band. I mean, they would go to other cold places around uh, Ontario. But um, you know, the, really, the breaking into the states doesn't happen until uh, until that first record, and they they kind of break in the Midwest, and then they're they're kind of all over the place there. They concentrate on on the Midwest, and they actually concentrate. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but they probably concentrated more on the states in getting a grounding than they even did in Canada. Canada is a hard place to tour for anybody, but even them being Canadian, um, you know, they quickly realized that uh, really to make it, you know, they've, they've got to be in the states all the time, and that's what they did. So obviously your Detroit, your Cleveland's, your, you know, Indianapolis, all, all that, uh, many, Minneapolis, all those kind of upper Midwest type markets initially? Yep, yep. Pittsburgh, St. Louis were uh, were early strongholds. That first big tour for them, they were playing with your eye heat. But most of those early tours, there was uh, in the 70s, you had kind of a jump on, jump off situation if you were a backup band. It wasn't so stratified that you would spend 50 or 75 dates with one band. Um, so they were, they played with all the, you know, all our favorite 70s greats. And, uh, and yeah, they just became a band that had that, that uh, stronghold in the, in the Rust Belt, you know, the Midwest rock, uh, uh, scene right with uh, with the likes of Sticks and Ted Nugent and Kiss and Aerosmith and all those guys, Blue Oyster Cult, Black Oak Arkansas, uh, your I Heap. So uh, you know, and and they you know they they eventually would cover all of the states and they they did pretty good in the South as well. Um, but you know they weren't considered particularly the you know the biggest uh, coasts band, and uh, and they they really didn't travel too far even when they got going. I mean they they weren't exactly a huge huge world band the way that the likes of, like, say, Iron Maiden or, or Deep Purple were. Yeah. Now, obviously, Geddy Lee and Alex Lifeson hit it off at a early age. What do you think it was about their personalities that really made them click and be, you know, the best of friends forever? 
think it was just the circumstances of living close by and sharing records and all that and just being sort of normal, uh, normal, nice Canadian boys, you know, uh, good family lives. Um, although Getty's father died when he was pretty young, um, he basically, you know, through sustained injuries and illnesses from being in concentration camps. Um, so when Getty was about 12, I think it is, his father died. So he quickly became kind of the man of the house and, you know, and, and eventually, you know, he was a, he was a good kid and, and so was Alex, but they basically, you know, eventually there were some hard times in deciding, hey, we, we're not going to go off to university. Um, we're going to really pursue this thing. So, you know, they transitioned into that. They both loved music. They were, they were both kind of music fanatics and they, and they quickly got into it. And, and then John Rutsey was, you know, the reason he wasn't in the band later is I, I think he kind of scared the guys a little. He was a little bit, you know, dramatic. And he, as, as Alex says in the book, he would like ostracize uh, people like there'd be friends drama going on. And he also kind of didn't take care of himself. He was more of the party guy, even though he had diabetes. He was probably the biggest biggest partier in the band. So, you know, the, the writing was quickly on the wall that they had to do something. And it obviously changed them forever. Yeah, now famously, Getty had quite the high-pitched voice. I mean, uh, it was <laughs> definitely a lot to get used to, even though we had the Robert Plants and, you know, a lot of high-pitched singers in the 70s. You know, um, was there ever a situation where they were trying to temper his voice or or thought they might have to... You know, blend towards the middle at all, you know, or was they unapologetic, you know, and this is us, it's going to make us more unique, you know, we really can't change what we got. That's really interesting. I've never been asked that before and never even really considered that. Um, you know, they, they were they were definitely asked along the way, but, but not too insistently. They were asked along the way, like, can you write some more accessible music? But I've never heard anybody internally tell Getty to try to change his style vocally. Um, you know, definitely the critics said all sorts of uh, very negative things about it. And, and you're right, it is a very novelty voice. I mean, I use the word novelty because there are certain singers where you know, this voice is something you have to confront and decide whether you're going to like this band or not. I mean, I think of the, um, you know, the uh, the warbling vibratos of the guy in Family or Pavlov's Dog or the guy in the undertones, Virgil Sharkey, but you also think of, like, guys like King Diamond with that falsetto. And oddly, as kids, I remember um, we, also, we also had a very, very strong radar up to voices we didn't like, and we would trash complete bands because of it. And one of them, uh, weirdly enough, was the Ramones. We couldn't get past Joey Ramone's voice, but for some reason, Getty's voice never was a bother. Um, it's high pitched, but it's but like I say, it's a novelty. It's a strange voice, and you you either can get into the band or you can't get into the band just because of his voice. Now later on, Getty, in his you know sort of thirst for creative change, um, went along himself, and and probably he's starting to see his voice as a little limited. But he probably also started seeing it as a little unbecoming, and he started to sing in a lower register. And uh, to my mind, I don't I don't think uh, I don't think it's that much of a success. I mean, Getty singing in a lower register, not pushing much air, is, is not that interesting a voice, I don't think. Um, I, I, really, I really like when he's going for it. Well, they definitely created, you know, that uh, demand on the audience. You either loved him or you hated him. You couldn't, couldn't stand his voice or they were so unique, you know. They had uh, somewhat of a cult audience to begin with and obviously continued to cross over, you know, more and more. Let's talk a little yeah. bit about that first album, you know, Working Man, Finding My Way. You know, obviously this is before Neil Peart was uh, contributing lyrics and all that. Um, do they do they still consider those songs, you know, um, very important to the development of the band? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. They, they essentially have one record that sounds like that, and then nothing ever sounds like that again. Um, you know, they, I think they, they really realized over time that uh, there is a fondness for those songs, and, you know, from the audience. And they weren't, you know, they, they weren't so negative about that album that they were just, they, they just trashed those songs out of the set list. 
I mean, a lot of those songs stayed around for a long, long, long time. Um, Working Man probably has played at every Rush show. I don't know. I, I can't think off the top of my head. But a lot of those songs were, were, you know, kept in the sets. Now, you ask about that record. I mean, one thing I do remember about that record and, and still feel to this day, for 1974, it's a pretty heavy album. I mean, there's there, we didn't have a lot of heavy records to choose from in the 70s, right? Yeah. Um, and this was, this was a pretty heavy record. It was well recorded. Um, it was dynamic. I mean, I, I think it's more exciting than a bad company record. I mean, I, I don't see, and I also don't see a lot of similarities to a Led Zeppelin record. There's a little bit of that. I think Working Man's got a little bit of Sabbath to it. Um, what You're Doing is a big, heavy, bluesy song. Um, you know, a little bit of a blues structure, but a little little Black Sabbath in there as well. So, uh, so no, I, I think I, I think it was a good, solid record. It's certainly the kind of record that would get people's attention, and that's what happened when they, you know, when they played it in Cleveland and the whole apocryphal story of Donna Halper. You know, people phoning in thinking it was the new Led Zeppelin album because there hadn't been one for a while, right? It was Houses of the Holy before that. So, right. um, so yeah, it it captured attention pretty quickly, and uh, and Cliff Bernstein basically signed them out of um, you know. Mercury, uh, when Mercury was based in Chicago, pretty much right away. Well, obviously the band, um, you know, developed from there with the addition of Neil Peart. You know, talk about, you know, the blending of this new new member, because I know they had a, I believe they tried a different drummer in between, but, you know, it, it wasn't an immediate fit. I mean, obviously Getty and Alex were uh, friends for years. Talk about, um, you know, what they saw in Neil that really made them the classic lineup. Well, I think with Neil right away, I mean, I remember one quote, they looked at each other and said, he reads books. You know, I mean, it's it was pretty interesting that they, they kind of thought, glommed on pretty quick, that uh, this is a guy who could possibly write our lyrics, which is odd to have the drummer write your lyrics. Um, but Getty and Alex really didn't have that much inclination towards that. So, so A, I mean, they got this literary guy. They hit it right off the bat on, on sharing certain, you know, comedy stuff and Monty Python and things like that, right? Um, but so... so so they shared, um, you know, they shared kind of, you know, so, some limited amount of books that they were into, but comedy, and they hit it off on a personal level, and they saw this lyrical end, but they also saw this drummer that they thought, you know, pretty much they thought his chops were above both of their chops at the time, and, you know, they're thinking, we, we got to take this guy, because he's obviously an amazing drummer, you know, and they, they had a, a, a latent or moderate love and understanding of progressive rock as well uh, so far but but you know this basically uh, untapped that uh, bottle uncorked that bottle towards we could we could really change the band with this guy in the band so um, so yeah I, I think he was an immediate catalyst to to changing the band and and I think over time one of the cool things he did for those guys is, is essentially um, you know being being such a renaissance man or, or, or you know methodically over even the 70s and 80s becoming a renaissance man, I think he brought Getty and Alex along in having a lot of cool, unique interests and being, you know, pretty pretty complex guys compared to your average rock and roller. They were into a lot of cool things, and I think Neil was kind of uh, kind of a good inspiration in that direction as well. Well, they obviously hit the ground running with Fly By Night, the title track, got mass airplay, obviously opened him up more and more to bigger tours and I know they they did a lot of touring with Kiss at the time. Um, talk, talk talk about what that album did to really, you know, give them more legs. I think the coolest thing about that album is it invents a whole new genre of music, progressive metal. Um, that really did not exist before. I mean, Rush basically took progressive rock and and heavy metal and just just slammed them together and and pretty clear cut became the only band that that is sort of doing this. I mean, I, I try to think of comparisons and I can't get much farther than Styx, King Crimson, Kansas, a little bit of Led Zeppelin, a little bit of the Who, um, but basically um, they were essentially progressive rock with a distortion pedal turned on, right? Um, so, yeah, they had Bytor and the Snow Dog and Anthem on there, which were, were really progressive, note-dense bands, a lot of changes and stuff, and a lot, of, a lot of big swoopy drum fills. So that album was super exciting. It caught a lot of people's attention in a whole different way than the first one caught people's attention. Um, you know, and some of that attention is, how dare these guys do this? This is in such bad taste. Oh, they're overplaying for the songs, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, if, 
you're the only one sticking your neck out there doing that, you you are a pretty unique band, and they were they were a completely unique band. And again, it was pretty heavy for the day for 1975. It's a pretty heavy record. Um, you know, the, the song titles like like By Torn the Snow Dog, pretty flashy sounding, right? Um, so yeah, they they kind of went up uh, with that record. Um, things were things were on the upswing, and then and then the next record, things were on the downswing again. <laughs> yeah, what what do you think it was about Chris of of Steel? Were they just so into their own world that it just didn't um, have more you know melodic reach, or what? What do you think it was with that next step? I think it's a few things. You know, when when I reflect back on it, it's like. The album cover is really dark and somber and, and really not inviting, right? Um, I think the production is actually slightly worse than Fly By Night. I think it's a little little bit thin on the bottom end. Um, and then, of course, they did go... Um, they did go even more long and proggy with Necromancer and Fountains of Lamneth. So, so the so the song lengths they're, they're, they're way longer. They've got all these crazy part names to them, and uh, and there's less of them than on Fly By Night. Other than that, you know, I mean, there's not really you know Lakeside Park is a little bit like the song Fly By Night, but it's a little little dour and sad and poignant, I suppose. Um, less uplifting to be a single. I think I'm going bald. You know, could have been a single, although they kind of make fun of it. But that's a, you know a funny enough song that it could have been a single. Best Deal Day, super heavy. Uh, so yeah, I, I just think it's uh, overall it's just a less accessible album. Um, they're just gonna they're gonna capture uh, less uh, less flies with honey like that, right? It's uh, it's just definitely a darker, weirder record. Yeah, obviously coming off of Five by Night, it um, it didn't expand, you know, their audience, and I'm sure they were under a lot of pressure by Mercury Records to, you know, e- either the sales got to go up or you guys got to go. Yeah, and uh, and what they did is they basically, you know, committed suicide and said, uh, we're just if if we're going to crash in flames, we're we're still going to just keep doing what we do. We want to do another record like this. We don't hate Caress of Steel. Um, so they they essentially went in and um, and made a record that really is not a heck of a lot more accessible, I don't think, than Caress of Steel. It's just better done. I mean, it's uh, I mean, yeah, it does have more more songs that seem to have a start and an end. And uh, and it just it does seem more focused, I suppose. But it's also way better recorded. I think the performances are fantastic on it. Um, it's it's a little it invites you in with that spooky you know red pentagram on the cover. It's uh, it's you know and progressive rock is big at this time, so it's it's not a time when progressive rock is a bad idea. Heavy metal is big at this time. This is a golden age. You know, 1976 is like uh, you know uh, Kiss. Alive into Destroyer and Aerosmith Rocks and Ted Nugent, uh, the the debut and Free for All. I mean, this is Blue Oyster Cult, Agents of Fortune. It's a good time for these bands that are semi similar to this, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's just uh, it's still it's still a progressive rock record, but uh, somehow the fans basically said, "All right, enough already." You twisted my arm. We all love Rush now, and that record went uh, went gold eventually. So, so that was uh, putting them right back on uh, on the good path, and uh, and they basically looked at themselves at that point, and said, "We're not we're not going to let anybody tell us what to do anymore. We're just going to make the records we want to make." Yeah, well, twenty one twelve obviously, like you say, had a more inviting cover, stronger image of the band on the back. I mean, it was, it was definitely making a statement. And with the better production, you know, like you say, we're we're, we're coming off a dark side of the moon and brain salad surgery, and I, I, obviously the the uh, the Zeppelin, you know, physical graffiti. This was uh, def- definitely a, an inviting time for them. And what's interesting about that record, too, is uh, I, I believe I, I looked this up earlier, and I, I sometimes remember these things and forget them, but I, I think it's a double platinum album uh, at this point, which is pretty amazing because there's nothing really that you would call a hit single on it. There's some there's some tracks, granted, that they play on classic rock radio now, um, but, but there's no really big pop single on, on the record. So for it to go double platinum, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and that leads us to A Farewell to Kings, which obviously with a song like Closer to the Heart, this is Getty in a more subdued, 
you know, almost acoustic type, uh, you know, intro where it was way more accessible. I know radio re really grabbed onto that and, you know, with the farewell to Kings, obviously they were elevated to headline status in America and to talk about what that album really did for the band. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. I mean, it's uh, it's it's they're still doing great, but I mean, I would I would argue probably that for that next eighteen month period, they're they're more or less still riding the high also of twenty one twelve at that point, um, because this record is. I mean, you're right. I mean, it has a hit single on it again. They haven't had a hit single since Fly By Night, um, and it's a it's a good accessible poppy song. It's a happy song. Granted, though, it's still very progressive. They still do a lot of crazy playing in it, right? Um, but uh, and the rest of the record is still pretty inaccessible. There's really no hits on it, um, and and they're they're still on, they're they're on that track. You're right. They are a, they are a headline act. They they kind of um, they they kind of, well. I, I'm not sure if they headline everything at this point, but they they essentially they are a, a kind of a unique band in that they they did never really go back down to that that uh, backup status ever again. They're one of these bands that vowed that you know even if we're gonna play small gigs, which which at this point the gigs are still pretty small. Uh, even if we're going to play small gigs, we're going to be a headlining act. So that's that's something that they and they and they kind of deserve it. I mean, they're just such a weird band to, to be this one progressive metal band in the world. It's it's like it is it is getting harder and harder to pair them up with anybody, right? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I I, I I haven't looked recently like how fast these records would sell um, as they came out of the gate. But I would think um, it, it happens in the business a fair bit that that the follow up album to a pretty successful one. You're you're still you're still celebrating the the old album a little bit. Well, I lived in the Seattle Vancouver area during that era, and obviously I could pick up. Canadian radio, you know, out of Vancouver, and yeah. obviously they, they were massive in Canada, playing all the hockey arenas and and all that, and it definitely translated into Seattle, Portland, I mean, the, the band got massive play, KISW in Seattle, and, you know, it, it really, in that area, they were one of the biggest hard rock bands that were accessible. I mean, Zeppelin had pretty cool. much stopped touring at that point, and, yeah. you know, it was not a lot of the British bands coming through on a regular basis. So, you know, in, in that Northwest, they were, they were definitely an arena act at that point. Yeah, and you mentioned the British bands. You think about it, Deep Purple has, has basically imploded. Your Eye Heap is... is more or less imploded. I mean, they're still making records, but nobody cares. Led Zeppelin stopped coming through. Black Sabbath, you know, between somewhere between Technical Ecstasy and Never Say Die. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of these big British bands are, are kind of in a in a little state of nowheresville. Um, but yeah, it, it's natural that Rush would uh, Rush would translate, um, you know, in, into the the Pacific Northwest uh, like that pretty well. And um, yeah, they're they're on the up and up, but it's still pretty complicated music but like i say uh you know Prague is still Prague is still doing pretty pretty well at this point genesis and jethro tull and and yes are all having pretty pretty healthy careers at this point yeah obviously um now with hemispheres you know this this was um you know the end of the 70s you know their last album they didn't necessarily have a song that was as accessible as closer to the heart on that album but again it continued to you know, develop their, you know, their level of production, and of course the live show really started to grow with the lighting and 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 all of that. You know, for a um, audience that was into the spectacle, you know, Rush was definitely delivering. Talk about the Hemispheres album and, and what that meant in their catalog. Yeah, I, I consider Hemispheres uh, to Farewell to Kings the same way as I consider. 2112 to caress the steel. <clears throat> Hemispheres just sounds like a better version of Farewell to Kings to me. I mean, I think the production's better, even though they're both made in Wales, you know, both recorded by Terry Brown, uh, who's incidentally been there since the beginning, but they are getting slightly different productions as they try these different places and whatnot. Um, but I think this is probably the best sounding album of the 70s that they put out, like good, good, 
good full bass, um, really kind of powerful guitars. I think I think even the songs, even though the songs are not written all that much heavier than previous songs, they come off heavier because I think Alex gets a nice rich tone uh, on this album. Full body drums and good bass. Um, you know, not not too uh, not too clangy. Uh, you know, uh, later Getty or, or Lemmy or Steve Harris kind of bass. You know, Getty later on in the '80s does some really weird things with his bass sound. But no, I think they get a good heavy sound on this record, and I think it's ex- essentially uh, as inaccessible or even less accessible than a Farewell to Kings. But um, it did have you know the big celebrated instrumental on it, La Vila Strangiato, and it had the trees on it. The trees got a lot of you know play as well. Um, obviously, not the hemisphere side got a lot of play, or circumstances wasn't played a lot. Um, even though it's probably my favorite Rush song, um, but no, it was a, it was a good album, and they're still on the up and up. And you know, the, the last uh, what well, actually last four albums have all been gatefold, so you know they're they're looking like they're a rich band, even though they're not. But uh, but basically, at this point, they're uh, they're they're pretty pretty well on their way. They're they're like they're like having a good healthy career as a, as a rock band. Yeah, now obviously that's, um, you know, they found their niche. They're um, really, really, really creating, like I say, their own sound. You know, they're out there, you know, with their own, you know, an audience that went from a, a, a niche audience to, you know, more and more of those mainstream hard rock, you know, Zeppelin, Deep Purple, you know, um, listeners. And, and obviously... FM radio was really strong at that point, so they'd go they'd go deeper into a cut rather than, you know, obviously commercial radio that's looking for the hit. Yeah. You know, um, do you think it was pretty much their their live show, the word of mouth that really really built their 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 loyal audience that you know whether they were hearing their new songs as much on the radio or not, you know, live they they delivered such a powerful experience. Yeah, I think so, but let me back up for a minute and, and slightly disagree with you on something earlier, because I think it's a pretty interesting point. Um, their audience, um, I think their audience has always been the exact same audience as the audience for Aerosmith or Kiss or Blue Oyster Cult and all that. I don't, I don't think, like, in the old days, I think it was just basically that blue jean army of people like me, like your young, angry metalheads that were into all these bands at the same time. I don't, I don't think, um, you know, I don't think it was, like, particularly a prog audience. Or put it this way, I mean, the same, the same, the metalheads would, would more than likely go to the prog shows anyways. But I think Rush's audience is essentially the exact same audience that was for all those great classic Midwest bands because you basically went and saw everybody and and you know music was there there you you weren't broken up into such small niches uh, all the time now now what you said about you know the the fact of the matter is it started off small and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger um but yeah, I, I think uh, I think all these bands that we all love from the '70s, it was basically the the same audience for for all of them. So whether you were a player or not, the players obviously could appreciate them a little more. Now, whether it's their live show, that's another interesting one because this is. I, I would say I would say. Probably yes, but this is a band because the music is so complicated and the records are so well done and and so well recorded, essentially, or so or so clearly recorded, and you get the lyrics and you get the gatefold and stuff. Um, I think I think this is a band where. Um, it, like it's not like ACDC live where it's so simple live that in a really bad, a uh, bad mix or, or or a really bad you know sound in a club with the the sound bouncing off the walls or something it's instantly lovable because it's so simple. This rush would be a little more of a challenge to make sound good on stage. Now having said that. Um,
the other thing I think that that uh, excited people or impressed them that it was because uh, I hear this all the time. Um, you know, quotes like "I can't believe it's just three guys making all that noise," like like doing all that and having come off the stage. So, so whether you're a player or not, you recognize them as virtuosos. That was really cool. And you got Neil with that massive drum set and the bells and the chimes and the gongs and all that stuff. And and that's always entertaining to look at, right? So, uh, so yeah, I, I think uh, I think there were a lot of a lot of cool appeals to them, and including the fact that that uh, that they got on the radio. So, God love you know FM radio in the seventies that they would play this stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, and God bless the drum tech. Can you imagine setting up that drum kit every night and tearing it down? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, and uh, you know, and and Rush also. I mean, they they do hint at uh, you know at certain times they had to play under very you know not great circumstances and didn't get sound checks and the stage was small and they had to rush and all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, you know, it you know this is demanding music. It, it's not that easy to 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 pull this off. They did that drum tech did have to have all that stuff put in place and all the Getty stuff. And when he started getting into you know, the bass pedals and the keyboards and you know if, if other effects on stage so um you know it, it was it was a pretty tricky uh, bunch of songs to pull off so they um you know they had they, they needed a little more ideal conditions than other bands put it that way well i know you had the opportunity to work on the documentary uh, the amazing beyond the lighted stage and i always and i've interviewed alex a couple times uh, what's amazing for such a serious progressive technical band what a sense of humor that Alex and Getty have. We saw it on the, you know, the later tour with the, um, the, the washing machines or the dryers on stage. And you see the interviews, and like you mentioned Monty Python earlier, these guys just broke each other up constantly backstage. And, you know, the dichotomy of this, like, funny, happy-go-lucky, you know, jokers taking the stage and playing the most progressive, complex hard rock there was. Yeah, and Neil's lyrics were were really, really serious too. I mean, they were they were basically about super heavy, lofty titles. They weren't particularly super sad, um, but they were they were lofty, right? So, uh, so yeah, there's that dichotomy as well. And uh, yeah, I, I just think they they basically had a little bit of a surreal sense of humor. They looked around and saw how everybody else was behaving, uh, and they and they realized, you know, this this is just ridiculous kind of this industry that we're in, and yet and yet we're. Um, you know we're playing this super serious music so i i think they just saw the um you know the humor in this situation and and realize that you know we're 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 like rock and rollers we we can't really take ourselves too seriously we'll we'll write these serious songs and and we'll and we'll play them you know uh you know we'll we'll give the people their money's worth and we won't show up uh loaded to to try to pull this off and we'll show up on time and all that stuff but um but yeah, I, I think they realized just to get through the um, you know the uh, indecencies of uh, of touring on a, on a small scale and you know station wagons and vans and Winnebagos and buses and all that stuff. Um, you know, I, I think they just had to do that just so they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't quit and or they wouldn't kill each other. Well, it's no secret, you know, through the seventies. There was a lot of marijuana use, you know, in the audience, and, you know, it's obviously legal in Canada, legal in most states here in America now, and, you know, not being a hard-drinking band, I've heard Getty joke about their audience being very aromatic, you know, with the <clears throat> with the clouds, you know, of, of smoke, you know, drafting onto the stage, you know, and I know Alex has spoken you know, about taking the edge off or being creative with a little cannabis, you know. Um, do you feel in, in a way that they were, you, you know, kind of um, one with their audience as far as an enjoyment of, um, you know, experiencing something that's really, you, you know, was taken way too seriously by the governments at that time? Yeah, I think so. And, and they, you know, they admit to smoking some pot. And I think Getty even joked that, you know, Caressa's steel was was made basically because they smoked a lot of pot. You know, that's why why it sounded like that. And and yeah, I mean, you, they, they, these songs are trips. You think of Xanadu and stuff like that. I mean, these songs are essentially uh, long Pink Floyd type excursions. Um, so it is, like, you know, and and even instrumentally, they're kind of blowing you away up there. So it is it is that kind of band. It's it's not so much. So much the um, the party band, although although 
although um, you know the heaviness and the and the dynamics when they are playing heavy songs, it, it quickly becomes a celebration and a party. But essentially, they are a uh, take us on a trip band. Yeah, and I know this is the first of a trilogy, and obviously, as Rush enters the '80s, you know, with Tom Sawyer and moving pictures and all that, there elevated to even you know larger radio staples and bigger sold out arena shows sometimes multiple nights in a city and then of course you go into the 90s so give us a little preview uh, of your next two books in this trilogy of you know the rush journey yeah, so the next one's going to be called Limelight Rush in the 80s, and that's out October uh, this year. And then the last one is called uh, uh, Driven Rush in the 90s and in quote marks in the end, and that takes you right up to the end of the band. So uh, they're both, the, all, all three of them are roughly the same length. I mean, these are big, thick books, and, um, you know, it's it's a bit of a long story. I won't go into the whole thing, but, I mean, I, essentially I did the uh, initial uh, authorized uh, biography of Rush back in 2003, Contents under pressure. This is with the same company. Put put uh, put a little deal together to use a lot of the stuff from the uh, from the movie because uh, I worked on that movie with those guys and I transcribed all that and saw how much gets on the cutting room floor to use a lot of that in here. And because I was doing it in conjunction with the authorized biography, we had all this wealth of material uh, that that we were going to initially do one big monster rush book, but I quickly realized it was going to be have to be split into three, and I thought it was cool a trilogy like that three guys in the band um so you get three books that are um that are around 125,000 words each which is longer than any rush books that i'd written previous um i did a couple others that were kind of unrelated and there's no real overlap with this um so you do get three long books they're essentially um you know proper hardcover reading books um they've each got they're each going to have like uh three eight page color sections in them of photos but other than that um they're they're not coffee table books um i've i've got two others that actually are coffee table books um and even that first one kind of was because it was full color throughout but it was short it was only 66,000 words that uh, that initial book so here we've got like 350,000 words um so hopefully it's the it's the, the final the final word on rush and uh i think most fans probably will end up with all three of them um because yeah i mean i i mean rush changes a lot over time but but essentially uh, if you're a rush fan you're 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 kind of into you're kind of into all of it in in a way which is kind of uh, an interesting thing with this band and with the sad passing of Neil Peart in the last year you know obviously they had you know been off the road it's been a number of years since their last tour uh, obviously the music lives on forever but you know Rush has closed the chapter of ever you know making music or performing live as Rush you know what what do you hope their legacy you know will be obviously they're the biggest Canadian rock group ever but where where do you feel they fit in the pantheon of rock and roll I think their legacy is huge. Um, you know, it helped to get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It helped to just sell all those records all those years. It helped to tour as hard as they did. I mean, not as hard as every every other massively, massively touring band, but, you know, every Rush show was massive starting in probably around 1980. I mean, I mean, every everything was in a hockey barn at that point, right? Um, so so Rush, Rush was sold you know millions of tickets probably uh, i don't know does that make sense yeah millions probably over the years so they so their tour their legacy is huge live their legacy is huge on record they had you know almost all their records went gold or platinum um and the other thing you know that finer point of being literally the band that invented progressive metal which turned out to be a genre that was quite varied later on and went in a lot of directions but really i think they're the um you know undisputed um you know they basically ran the whole thing and we're the only band doing it for all of the 70s um so that's a big part of the legacy uh you're, you're right canadian band that's another legacy um you know kind of an interesting thing that they are you know the biggest band ever to come out of canada um and that's about it and that's a lot i mean i think people love them i think their reputation over the years um has brought more people over to their side. I don't think people make fun of them as much as they 
might have in the in the eighties or even in the seventies. Um, you know, the eighties with the sort of keyboardy, new wavy feel that they they went into, or the seventies or with Getty's Voice or being progressive or being being metal. <clears throat> you know, all these things are viewed as negative by a lot of people, right? Um, but I think over time, all of that has softened, and uh, and they're they're generally way more beloved. And the other thing is they were they were big with charitable causes. Um, they were smart guys. Uh, obviously, they they did books. They were, they went out and like I say, you know, led a led a good life live lives and and been. And been Renaissance guys all along the way, so they were into a lot of different things. So I think I think they're a good inspiration, even just uh, on how to uh, live a good full life. Well, I know they've influenced millions of musicians and will for many years to come. And Martin, you've got quite the uh, you know discography yourself with all your books, you know, on Zeppelin and Van Halen, Queen, Sabbath, Maiden. I mean. You've got quite quite a roster people need to go check out. Where is the uh, best way they, they can go and find a good list and description of your books? Well, I would say that my main business every year is the mail order of my own books. So martinpopoff.com, every book that is in print, I have copies in my office that I sign and sell straight out of the office and ship out all over the world. And um, basically there's PayPal buy now buttons there for U.S., international, Canada, full descriptions of all the books. And, uh, yeah, that's that's really the best place. Anything in print, uh, I, I basically, you know, keep a store of, uh, of all these. So out of the, you know, 85 or 90 or whatever, uh, how many would be in print? Probably probably 45 to 55 titles are in print. So, yeah, martinpopoff.com. And you can email me at martinp at uh, inforamp.net um, with any questions. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. Well, congratulations on another great series. In closing, having talked to and studied so many artists and, and musicians over the years, what what are what are some of the you know like a life lesson you may be able to impart on a young musician or a young artist coming up today? I know the business is almost unrecognizable as when they came up, but you know as as far as the dedication or commitment to the music, what what might you uh, have learned o- over the course of your studies of so many greats that broke through? You know, that's an interesting question, and as you were saying it, I made sure I kind of got my wheels turning on it because it's a tough one, but I would say, um, and this relates a little bit to what I've done with these books as well, and Rush, and many other bands, but I would say keep making stuff. Make lots and lots and lots of stuff because... All that, all that old stuff will sell when the new one comes out, and then you put another one out, and that old stuff will keep selling. So if you stick around long enough and you make all this stuff, um, you have you have more stuff out there to sell. And and the other thing is, um, I think uh, you know, looking strictly at pure art, i.e., the music end of it. Forget me for a sec here. When these bands have these catalogs, I think I think um, all of these records relate to each other, and it's there's a synergy that happens or an exponential um, layers of meaning that that um, you know one to one can ascribe between all these works of art as time goes on so I guess put another way um, every time you put out a record it makes your last 10 records even that more interesting because you have more to compare to so I say, I would say stick around keep keep uh, keep doing what you're doing obviously do what you believe in don't follow trends but um, I, I really I really think a really cool thing is is um, when these bands can look back and they, and they do have 20 or 30 or 40 albums out. Well, Martin, it's been a real pleasure again. Anthem is the book. Rush is the band. Two more volumes coming up. Um, we can't wait to review the next ones. Thank you so much for joining us. Very cool, man. Thank you. This has been fun.